welcome everyone. I'm Ellen Dory Watson, the director of the Poetry Center. And um, we, we almost had Bill come a couple years ago. I don't remember how long it was. We, we had a plan for you to come to the Poetry Center and read, and then for some reason it didn't work out. So thank you, Jay, for making it happen. Um, wonderful, insightful, thoughtful translator of Chinese poetry, which I'm sure you all know. And we're really happy to have you. Um, I'm grateful to Smith's Buddhist Studies for bringing us the idea. And um, being the presenters, and to Five College Buddhist Studies Faculty Seminar, Amherst College, the University of Massachusetts for support of <coughs> this event. And I'm going to pass the baton to Jay for a proper introduction, and most of you probably know that he's Smith's Logic and Buddhist Studies program, uh, and Smith's Logic and Buddhist Studies programs, and the Five College Tibetan Studies India program, and he translates to and from Tibetan. And he's also visiting professor of Buddhist philosophy at Harvard Divinity School. Um, and I just want to, I always have this here to remind me to turn, to be on airplane mode or turn off the phone. Oh, oh, yeah. Jack. Yeah. Thank you, Hi, and I'll reiterate Ellen's thanks to all of our, our many sponsors about all these people coming together. There's no way we can do anything like this. And thank you to Ellen and the Poetry Center <coughs> for teaming up with us on this. Um, in a room like this, I can tell that the whole time doesn't need much of an introduction. I'll give him a little bit of an introduction. Um, last week, um, Bill Porter gave a talk at Amherst College. Um, <laughs> and Bill and Red Pine are remarkably um, similar in, in appearance to one another. Um, he drinks. They inhabit the same body, though they're, they're very different people. As many of you know, Bill is a terrific travel writer, and Red Pine is an amazing translator. I'm going to try not to talk about Bill today, because we talked about him at Amherst last week. Um, Red Pine has been translating Chinese poetry and uh, Buddhist sutra material for decades now, and is renowned for producing some of the most beautiful, poetic, lyrical translations of this material, material that captures the spirit better than just anybody else alive can do. Um, in his long career, he's translated Lao Tzu, he's translated a, a great deal of sutra material, including the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, the Platform Sutra. Um, he's translated the poems of um, Cold Mountain. Uh, he's translated um, poems of, of, uh, of Stonehouse, Pu Ming, um, Wei Ying Wu. Um, just there's so many of the really important uh, Song and Tang um, Chinese poets. Um, and the, the guy he knows, Red Pine, uh, Bill Porter, I mean, has also done a great deal of, of travel work related to um, Zen and to poetry in China. But one of my favorite recent books is one that the two of them were willing to co-author. <laughs> and it's just so, um, so unusual for people as different as Red Pine and Bill Porter. Um, it was time. Co-author. I'm kind of amazed that their friendship uh, survived the, the enterprise. But it's a terrific book that I recommend to you all called Finding Them Gone, uh, ch Visiting Chinese uh, Poets of the Past, in which Bill Porter does all of the travel writing to sites associated with these poets, but then Red Pine is gracious enough to translate their work on sites associated with their lives and death. Um, we've been trying for a long time to get Red Pine here, and we're really happy to have him here to read. So without further ado. Thank you, Jay. Um, wow. Well, you're all wondering, you know, why I called you here. <laughs> it was uh, uh, to talk about Chinese poetry. And so this is the character that the Chinese use to mean uh, when they want to refer to poetry. They started using it around um, 3,500, almost, almost 4,000 years ago, we, we, we begin to see this, this character. Uh, the left side of it is the word for language. And the right side of it means, nowadays, means Buddhist temple. And since around the second century AD, it meant Buddhist temple. Before that, it, it meant a government agency in charge of foreigners. <laughs> and and, and um, before that, though, I mean, obviously, language dealing with foreigners or dealing with monasteries doesn't have a lot to do with poetry per se. So the, the character actually had a, a, a different uh, 
this is the the left that if that left side. If you look at the the left side of the char the right side of the character, it it this thing that means monastery now um, used to mean this, this government agency, but uh, it's shorthand. The bottom part of this character is inch. It means inch by itself, and uh, the Chinese have a, a a way of describing the heart. They say the heart is the square inch. And so actually this character is shorthand for this character. Zhi, which means from the heart. Uh, you have the heart underneath and then that same squiggly thing on top. So, so the character poetry is really a, a combination of language and from the heart. The first person who described poetry in Chinese history around 200, 300 BC um, defined it as Zai Xin Wei Zhi, Fa Yan Wei Shi. If it's in the heart, it's this Zhi, it's this from the heart. If it's put into language, then it becomes poetry. So to the, to the Chinese and to Asians in general, poetry is a language of the heart. And it uh, gives it a, a special status. Um, and it was a language that, that had a purpose in ancient China. It was the language of instruction. If you really wanted to, of course, poetry does have greater mnemonic value than prose. It's easier to memorize, easier to sing, easier to pass on. Um, and so when the chi first Chinese dynasties developed, they developed along the Yellow River because, of course, that was the only place you could farm because of, there were no rocks and no trees because it was all mud. Yellow River is the muddiest river in the world, five times muddier than the nearest uh, second muddiest river, the Colorado, carries 50% of, of, of uh, mud. So the, all that big huge basin in, uh, in China was, was uh, nothing but mud and you could farm, you could irrigate, dig an irrigation canal with a, with a stick. You didn't need metal technology at all. So all these early dynasties are all located around the Yellow River. The ones that tend to be a little, little bit to the, to the west of the river are there for safety reasons because the nomads would sweep down from the north and just hassle all these early farmers, you know, uh, in the on the North China Plain. So this is where China began. And during that last dynasty, the Zhou Dynasty, uh, some Tibetans, some Tibetans invaded around 771 BC. And then the dynasty had to move its capital from the Chang'an area to Luoyang. And for the rest of the next thousand years, the capitals were these two, these two locations, Chang'an, uh, protected against invasions, and Luoyang out in the plains, which was much easier, had easier access to grain. Uh, uh, you know, the civilization depends on grain to fight wars. Um, and, and also salt. The Chinese never would have become the Chinese had it not been with control of salt. Because if you don't have salt, you can't preserve things, can't preserve things, you can't fight year round. Civilizations, all, all about warfare, it seems. Uh, salt and grain. So anyway, this is, this is where my little story begins. Um, in the town of Luoyang, if I go back there, you can see Luoyang out there uh, on the Yellow River, just south of the Yellow River where it goes out into the plain. Well, about three years ago, I was in Luoyang and I was looking for the you know, graves of poets and stuff like that. And, and I had a taxi driver and he said, I'll bet you I know something you don't know about Luoyang. And I, I was surprised that he would even say that. Uh, and I, he did, he took me to this place. This is an incredible spot. Um, if you look at it closer, look at that central piece of uh, that steely in the middle right there. It says, Confucius came here into the Zhou Dynasty capital to ask Lao Tzu about ritual and music. So this happened around 516 BC when uh, Lao Tzu was just getting ready to leave town. And so Lao Tzu used poetry 
to transmit his teaching to Confucius. Lao Tzu wrote what, what has to be the first book of poetry in Chinese history. He wrote a, a, a book of 81 poems called, we call it the Tao Te Ching. Well, the Chinese call it the Tao Te Ching. I think we call it the Tao Te Ching too. Anyway, so this young man, about 35 years old, comes for instruction. Confucius teaches him something, teaches him some of the basic elements of, of what he thought was the, the right way to live this life. And here's an example, verse number 80 uh, of the 81 verses. This is Confucius. Imagine a small state with a small population. Let there be labor-saving tools that aren't used. Let people consider death and not move far. Let there be boats and carts, but no reason to use them. Let there be armor and weapons, but no reason to employ them. Let people return to the use of knots, you know, using knots instead of written symbols to count, and be satisfied with their food, and pleased with their clothing, and content with their homes, and happy with their customs, and let there be another state so near, people hear its dogs and chickens, but live out their lives without making a visit. That's what I got to say to you, young man. And so Confucius, <laughs> I don't know, he goes back to Confucian land. And Lao Tzu leaves. He's, he, was, he was the record keeper of the Zhou Dynasty capital. And so he'd come to the point where he said, uh, obviously, if you read this poem and you read the, the book, he's obviously a Luddite. And so, <laughs> and so he left, obviously, looking for that perfect, that simple land, the plant, land of simplicity. And his lessons, of course, were contentment and simplicity. And so uh, he leaves town and comes to the Hangu Guan Pass, the most strategic place in all of ancient China. The, the Chinese said, whoever holds the Hangu Kwan Pass holds China. Even the, during the Second World War, the Japanese could not break through the pass. They had to fly around it to get to Xi'an. Um, so anyway, Lao Tzu came here. And this is where the Taoists say, and the historians say, this is where he wrote the entire uh, body of the Tao Te Ching. Um, so he used poetry as his means of instruction to teach contentment, but he also taught something else. He taught transcendence. Um, a couple years ago, um, well, there's his, the earliest known copy of the Tao Te Ching. This is a complete copy of the Tao Te Ching, 200 BC. Uh, we, get, we have partial copies of the Tao Te Ching, 300 BC. You know, all of it excavated from graves. You know, the old book. A couple years ago, I was uh, William Merwin was showing me around his palm grove in, in Maui and he came upon this, uh, uh, upon this stone. I said, what's that? Uh, and Merwin said, oh, that's my tombstone. He wanted to get it early, uh, ready early. A lot, of, a lot of the hill tribes I visited in China are like that. People are really proud if they get their coffin ready while they're alive. <laughs> so Merwin had his tombstone all ready and he had it on it was carved this verse from the Tao Te Ching. The valley spirit that doesn't die, we call the dark womb. The dark womb's mouth, we call the source of heaven and earth, elusive as gossamer silk, and yet it can't be exhausted. So there was a spiritual side to Lao Tzu's instruction. Confucius, though, was sufficiently impressed that uh, he decided to use poetry for his means of instruction, too. He went back to the capital uh, of, uh, of uh, the state of Lu, uh, Chifu, and he built this place, which is still there today. I mean, it's gone through some restorations periodically, uh, the Jusa Academy. This is where he also compiled the book, known as the Shi Jing, or the Book of Poetry. Um, it was an anthology of poems from every state in all of known China at that time. And he sort of intended it as a, as a, a manual for would-be diplomats. So that if you were an official and you were entertaining somebody from afar, or you were going afar, you could quote a poem. Um, you know, it's like when you, if you go to Russia and you sing some Bob Dylan songs or something like that. So, so anyway, he 
compiled this book called the, the, the Shi Jing. And so um, here's one of, the, one of the poems called Rustic Door. Hung men jersia kaichi chur. Beecher yang yang kailaji. Chi chi shir yu bi ha jir fang. Chi chi chu chi bi chi jir jang. Chi chi shir yu bi ha jir li. Chi chi chu chi bi song jir zi. So this is obviously his book is about the different states that he's trying to introduce his would-be officials to. Behind my rustic door, I can live in peace. Beside this flowing stream, I can live with hunger. If I'm to eat a fish, must it be a bream from the river? If I'm to take a wife, must it be a beauty from chi? If I'm to eat a fish, must it be a river carp? If I'm to take a wife, must it be a song princess? So this, his poems, too, were about contentment. He was teaching a moral way of life, but not liberation, certainly not liberation. We've got some great seats in front, and one over back in there, too. So um, Confucius actually told people, no spirits, keep the spirits at a distance. So he, his, his books and his poetry, uh, the Shi Jing, was about, about this life, this society, and not about liberation or the next life. Um, it wasn't until about a century or so later that we actually get a, a real poet, a poet with a name, because all of Confucius' poems were from the public domain. He just, there's no names associated with, the, with these poets. And so we go from the Yang, we go down from the Yellow River. I can't get around there, but you'll just have to assume that that second river in the middle of China, that's the Yangtze. And so in the watershed of the Yangtze, in the Yangtze Gorges, up a side gorge, in the mountain village of Leping Li lives China's first great poet, a man named Qu Yan. These are his dates. And this is a shrine built on his own house by the farmers that live there. In fact, the farmers that live there uh, are still poets. They have the world's second oldest poetry society. It's been there uh, since the Ming Dynasty. Um, not every farmer is a poet, but they're, they have, they've been collecting poets, poems of themselves since the 1300s. The only older poetry society that I know of is the one in Toulouse, which honors the, uh, the troubadours. They give a poetry prize to uh, the greatest, po greatest poet of the year uh, who who's, writes poetry in Occitane, Languedoc. Anyway, this is where, where Chi Yan lived. And um, after a few years, he went out to the big city and became educated and he became an advisor to the king. And this is where he wrote the first great poem in the Chinese language known as Li Sao, or Encountering Sorrow, um, in, which, in which he uses, he's an advisor to the king and he wants to criticize people, so he uses the names of plants to represent all the jerks. Uh, and his ruler he refers to as sweet flag, a kind of iris. And it's 46 stanzas, uh, 46 stanzas, but I'm going to read five, five of them just to give you an idea of the progression of his argument and also of the style. Blessed with an abundance of inner beauty to which I added acquired skills, I donned Angelica and Lovage and twined autumn orchids into a belt Swiftly I traveled as if I were late, fearful my time was short. In the morning I gathered wild gardenias. In the evening I collected marsh sedge. Amid illicit pleasures of partisan cliques, on paths of darkness fraught with danger, I wouldn't care if I died as long as my lord's chariot stays safe. I urged him this way, then that. 
on the mighty way of ancient kings, but sweet flags saw not my heart. He deceived, deceived by slander, he spurned me. Turning away, I let my eyes roam. I looked into the wilds around me. My belt was adorned with flowers, whose fragrance grew ever stronger. Everyone finds joy in something. My constant is a love of beauty. Even, dis even dismembered, I, I would never change. How could I forsake my heart? In this age of chaos and change, how can I remain any longer? The orchid and iris have lost their fragrance. Sweet flag and cymbidium are mere grasses. Where are the sweet-smelling plants of the past? All we have now is wormwood. What other reason could there be than the death of the love of beauty? Alas, in this land where none understands me, why should I care for its ancient city? Since no one is able to govern with beauty, I shall go where, where drowned heroes dwell. Um, this was the, the capital where he wrote that poem. Um, and of course, lo not long after it, he was banished. Um, the trouble with being a poet in China is you're connecting your heart to your mouth. That is, <laughs> that is never a good idea in gov as an official. You could do it at home, but uh, not out in public. And so he was banished uh, to this so uh, south of the Yangtze. I can't do my finger thing, so you'll take, take it from me. He, to the watery confines of, of near Dungting Lake, where he meets a fisherman meets a fisherman, and he writes this poem about himself, entitled, The Fisherman. When Xu Yan was banished, he wandered along rivers. He sang on their banks, weak and forlorn, until the fisherman asked, Aren't you the lord of the gorges? What fate has brought you to this? Xu Yan answered, The world is muddy. I alone am clean. Everyone is drunk. I alone am sober. And so they sent me away. The fisherman said, a sage isn't bothered by others. He can change with the times. If the world is muddy, splash in the mire. If everyone is drunk, drink up the dregs. Why get banished for deep thought and purpose? But Chi Yuan said he had heard, when you wash your hair, you should dust off your hat. When you take a bath, you should clean your robe too. Why should I let something so pure be ruined and wronged by others? I'd rather jump into the river and be buried in a fish's gut than let something so white be stained by common dirt. The fisherman smiled and rowed away singing. When the river is clear, I wash my hat. When the river is muddy, I wash my feet. Once gone, he was heard from no more. Um, and uh, to wash your hat means to get ready to serve. To wash your hat means uh, wash your feet means to retire to the countryside. So Chu Yuan took, to, took his own advice and jumped into the river. Um, and ever since then, the Chinese have celebrated, in a sense, his death by organizing the, the Dragon Boat Festival. Uh, it usually occurs uh, within a few days of the summer solstice. It's the fifth day of the fifth uh, lunar month. And so it's Poets' Day in China. It has been for 2,000 years. And so everybody in different villages around where he drowned, uh, they build these boats, um, outfit them with heads, make them really fancy, and they go out and go into the river and try on the fifth day of the fifth month, which is apparently the day he drowned, to find his body before the fishes do. Um, and so they throw stuff into the river, you know, uh, dumplings, uh, uh, Chinese-style tamales, to, uh, they call it, to, to, so they can get to his body before the fishes do. Um, and, yet, and yet, despite being banished, despite, despite all the slander, he still sought to serve. And it's the, ult it's the conundrum that runs through all of Chinese poetry. To serve or not to serve. And in, the, in the third century AD, we're going back up north now to the town of Luoyang, where Lao Tzu once lived. And in the third century AD, we get another answer to this conundrum of serve 
or not to serve. And these are a group of men known as the seven sages of the bamboo grove led by Ranji who decided rather than serve, if we have to serve, we'll get drunk at court and when they let us go, we'll go to the mountains and meditate. And that's what they did. And this is where they did it. Oh no, excuse me, that's the grave of Ranji. Um, died around, you know, 230 something, whatever. Uh, and a lot of people have used his picture, he's the one in the middle, and the other sages in their graves. These are grave tiles, incidentally, of Ranji and his pals who would just get drunk at court so they were totally uh, perceived as being harmless and then they would go off to the, to the mountains and these were the mountains they went to just north of Luoyang across the Yellow River, the Taihong Mountains, very difficult to, to get in, into those mountains. And that's where they, they meditated uh, and uh, performed different kinds of, of Taoist yoga. And uh, Ranji uh, wrote one of the, the first uh, uh, great series of, of poems, 70 poems, called Songs of the Heart. And this is just an example of, of one of his songs. Again, these guys, people are into meditation and yoga. When they're at court, they're drunk, but when they're in the, in the hills, they're, they're, they're serious. They're Taoists. Yo bei zi yo qing, wu bei wu se. Go fei ying wang gu, he bi wan li ji. Xiang feng fu chong xiao, qing yun jiao suo xi. Mie xin ji gu ku jai, he gu ren jian zi. If we're, if we're sad, it's because we have feelings. If we had no feelings, we would be insensate. As long as we don't become trapped or have to explain why we need an estate. Soaring on the wind, we touch the sky and crimson clouds lit by the sun with minds made of ashes in our dead tree bodies why would we turn toward worldly attractions? But having succeeded in forgetting ourselves, can we learn to leave ourselves in peace? In, in addition to cultivating meditation, Ranji and his friends cultivated uh, a qi generating form of yoga known as Chang Xiao or droning. And here's the, the base of his old, of Ranji's old droning tower, which was once 80 feet high. So you go up there and you drone. Um, I haven't met any Taoists in modern times who drone, but uh, a couple of years ago I was in Inner Mongolia and I met, I met, uh, oh, what's that? I thought I had another slide in there. Is that a tree? Yeah. And that's the droning tower, and that's the mountains. Well, I guess I don't have it. Yes, I do. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a descendant of Genghis Khan, and I, he, it was a party, and he was singing Mongolian pop songs, and I, I just happened to say, so do you know how to drone? And he did, and he did a fantastic job of, of, of droning. Sometimes you, you, you hear about some Mongolian groups doing it, uh, the Tuvans, the throat singers, it's, it's, it's one form of droning, but, but the Dao, these Taoists were doing it for qi generation, not for music. And so around the same time that, that, um, that uh, uh, Ranji was alive, another uh, Taoist named Cheng Zan wrote an ode to droning, and here's just a couple lines describing it. It's a sound not dependent on an instrument. It requires nothing to create it, nothing but a person's own body. They focus their mind and control their breath. They move their lips and a tune comes forth. They open their mouth and produce a sound. Whatever they meet or encounter inspires a response in song. It doesn't annoy when it's loud. It doesn't disappear when it's faint. It's purer and more forceful than a flute, softer and more refined than a zither. Ethereal enough to reach the realm of spirits, subtle enough to probe the mysteries. Creatures all dance and tap their feet. Phoenixes prance and flap their wings. Know then, the wonder of droning is the pinnacle of all sounds. So that was this, this drunk Mongolian. Um, let's see. 
I go back up to that tree. Uh, five centuries after Ranji, uh, a ta one, of the, one of the more po famous poets of the Tang was a man named Wang Wei, who was prime minister, a deputy prime minister, but also had a country estate. Uh, and uh, this was a tree he planted, a ginkgo tree. Um, and this is where he would come to drone. And if you're wondering why it's such a bad photo photograph, why it's backlit, it's because there were police just about to arrest me when I took this photograph. Because in, just beyond that tree, believe it or not, is a ballistic missile warhead factory. <laughs> Don't ask me. And They left the gate open. And I just, <laughs> they couldn't believe somebody would wander in there. Um, anyway. This is his bamboo retreat. Du zuo yo huang li, tan xin fu chang xiao, shen lin ren bu zhi, ming ye lai xiang zhao. Sitting alone amid dense bamboo, playing my zither and droning, deep in the forest, no one else knows until the bright moon looks down. Okay, now there's the... But well, meditation and yoga offered a solution to the serve or not to serve conundrum, there was one other option, and that was farming. And again, now down along the Yangtze, again, I can't point to it, but it's somewhere down the middle reaches of the Yangtze, on the south end of it, is well, my favorite poet, and I think every, every Chinese poet's favorite poet. It's a guy you've you got to love. His name is Tao Yuanming. Um, this is, he's, after 30 years of working for the man, he wrote, Returning to Live on My Farm. I was socially awkward when I was young. I preferred hills and mountains instead. Unwittingly, I fell into the world of red dust. I was trapped for 30 years. But a bird on a tether longs for the woods, and a fish from the ocean recalls the old depths. After clearing some land south of town, I retired to farm and be simple. My property includes more than three acres. My thatch hut is maybe nine mats wide. Elms and willows shade the garden and back. Peach trees and plum trees spread across the front. The nearest village is off in the haze. Smoke hangs above its earthen walls. In a distant lane, a dog barks. A rooster crows from a mulberry tree. There's no dust or trash in my yard. My house is empty but filled with peace. No longer imprisoned in a cage, I'm back again and I'm free. And being free, of course, he had time to read. And a, a couple of his favorite books was the, uh, the, uh, the Tale of King Mu. King Mu was a Zhou Dynasty king, lived around 1000 BC, who, who went on these long, long trips to, to the, uh, the known quarters of the world. Another book was called Mountains and Waters. It was a supposedly first made, written around 1800 BC and then was updated periodically. Uh, it was a guide to all the spiritual geography uh, in China. So every mountain, all the sacred spirits on every mountain and every river were recorded in it. So this is uh, Tao Yanming's On Reading the Book of Mountains and Waters. The first month of summer, all the plants are tall. The trees around my house are dense. Birds are glad to have a place to roost. I love this refuge of mine too. Having finished with plowing and planting, I've returned to my books again. Such a remote lane doesn't see many ruts. It tends to deter even the carts of friends. But a cup of new wine makes me happy, and vegetables fresh from my garden, and the lightest of rains from the east, and with it a welcome breeze. I skim the tale of King Mu, and I glanced at the pictures in mountains and waters. Having surveyed the whole world, how can I not be happy? So this was the village he lived in. There's the bottom, that, that, that mountain is called Lushan. It's, uh, again, south shore, central, middle, middle, middle of, the, of the Yangtze. Um, this is the, the last, no, not the last time, uh, in 2005, when I visited this place, uh, in that building, the la his last l l male descendant had died the week before. 1,600 years, 
and his family and descendants have been living in this mud brick village. Um, one of one of the, his favorite poems that I like is uh, number five of his drinking poems. Jelu zai ren jing er wu che ma xuan wen jin he nang er xin yuan di ze pian zai ju dong li xia you ran jian nan shan shan qi er xi jia fei niao xiang yu huan ze zhong you jian yi yi bian yi wang yan I built my hut beside a path but here no cart or horse. You ask, how can this be? A distant mind is a far off place. Picking chrysanthemums by the eastern fence, I lose myself in the southern hill. The mountain air, the sunset light, birds flying home together. In this there is a truth I'd explain if I could remember the words. And so that was a, Tao Yun Ming's old village, and the, the, view, the view to the south. And uh, about 300 yards to the west was his drinking rock. Um, uh, you can't really see it in this photograph, but the great Neo-Confucian philosopher Zhu Xi came here uh, around the year 1000 and, and covered it with an inscription of, uh, on his, of, of his visit. The rock is still there in the inscription. Um, it's, it's being worn away, but it's still there. And this is where... Tao Yun Ming came to drink, and one day he looked up at that scene right there, right where you're, where you're seeing, and he came up with this story, the story of Peach Blossom Spring. There were peach blossoms in the stream, and he, this fisherman saw them and wondered where they're coming from. There are no peach trees on this hill, and so he follows them upstream to this cleft in the rocks, and he goes, squiggles through the rocks, and he comes into this, in this isolated land that is, is, has been preserved for centuries uh, meets people there who spoke a strange dialect from, uh, from past centuries and has a great time and then they finally uh, escort him back to the crack and tell him, well be sure don't tell anybody about this place. Um, and he said, oh I, 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 I won't. But he leaves crumbs, you know, he, mar he marks trees and rocks on the trail as he goes back to town and tells the, the local officials, I guess where I've, I found this wonderful Shangri-La paradise land up in the mountains. Um, and they all go try to find it again and they never do. And so it's called Peach Blossom Spring. Um, and it made a big impact, that story, uh, on a lot of poets. One of them was the poet Li Bai, who lived also uh, along the Yangtze. That's the mountain where uh, he, he, when he was, I think, 24, he got married, and the next, uh, he built his wife uh, a house at the foot of the mountain, and then he went to, up to the top and over to the backside and built himself a hut. <laughs> Guys do things like that. <laughs> and anyway, he wrote this poem when, when he came there called Conversation in the Mountains. When yu he yi qi bi shan xiao er bu da xin ce xian ta hua liu shui yao ran qu bie you tian di fei ren jian You ask why I settled on Jade Mountain? I smile and don't answer. My heart is at peace. Peach blossoms in the stream disappear into the distance. There's another world beyond the world of man. And um, the mountain, as you can see, still remembers Levi's visit. Um, but writing poetry in ancient China wasn't lim limited to men. It was just that it was more important to men. Uh, you know, anybody trying to serve in the government had to be a poet. Women wrote poets, poems too, but no one bothered to collect them, um, at least not until printing. Came, came around. Around a thousand years ago, you finally see people collecting women's poetry. And one of my favorite is Zhu Xu Zhen, um, who lived around the same time as the other uh, great female poet, Li Qing Zhao, that is to say the 12th century. Um, and I think I have a, let's see, we're, oh, now we're going to the mouth of the, Yang, the Yangtze. 
and uh, the gra end of the Grand Canal, you know, you can see it end at near Hangzhou. Well, just before you get to Hangzhou, you get to where she was born. This is Zhu Shu Jun, her name in Chinese or ro Romanized. Those are her dates. So, so Lu, well, there's that. Oh, there's, there she is. Okay, that's her. It's just making sure. Uh, so, uh, so uh, Zhu was born in Lujong, Lujong, a canal town between Shanghai and Hangzhou. And I'm just going to read from my book, uh, Finding Them Gone. Because I, what I did a couple of years ago, I, I made up a, 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 an itinerary. I wanted to honor all the poets I could in 30 days. I just decided 30 days. Um, and I took with me the best whiskey I could get my hands on. And I would go around to the graves of each of these great poets and pour whiskey uh, on the graves. Well, I would, put it, the, the, I would put the whiskey in little cups like this, and whatever they didn't drink, I did. <laughs> and uh, it's a good thing I wasn't driving. I had usually a taxi driver or something like that. Um, so anyway, I wrote this book called Finding Them Gone. So Zhu was born in Lujong, a canal, canal town between Shanghai and Hangzhou. The canal is still there, as are the two-story houses on both sides of the narrow street that borders it. It looks quite picturesque. Halfway through the village, I found the Zhu Shu Jun Exhibition Hall. It was easily the nicest building in the village. Someone in Lujong clearly loved her. After reading the poems copied out on the walls, I walked back outside. There was a small dry goods store across the street, run by an old couple, and I thought maybe they had some books for sale. They didn't, but the man surprised me. He su suggested I have a look at Jushu Jen's old house. I didn't know her house or a descendant of it had survived. The man said to go back the way I had come, turn right, then left, then right. Her house, he said, was next to a pavilion that overlooked a much smaller canal. Five minutes later, I returned and asked him if he could guide me. I must have taken a left when I should have taken a right. He hadn't been there a while in himself, but he agreed. He was 91 years old and had to retrace, retrace his steps several times, but he found it. After telling the people who lived there what I was doing, he went back to his store. It was a fairly large and very old building that probably dated back to the end of the Qing Dynasty, and it was occupied by several families. The residents were quite friendly and invited me in, but I didn't feel like intruding. I, backed around, I walked back around to the pavilion that overlooked another canal. I could imagine Ju sitting there in spring, writing the, pro, the poem she entitled, Events on a Spring Day. Qing Han Jin Sui Hua Qi Wan Zhou Lu Zan Lian Jie Yuan Bo Yue Zhao Zhe Bai Yu Fan Yu Chi Quan Lin Huang Niao Du Jin Cuo Xian Zhang Shi Zhao Lin Xuan Du Jing Ting Yu Quan Ge An Ge Jin Er Ji Quan Qing Mai Mai Yan Qian Wu Shi Nai He its teeth clenching cold and the flowers are late. Green ripple upon ripple joins the distant waves. Fish rise from river grass showing off their jade flanks. Orioles weave through trees like shuttles made of gold. I look through drafts of my poems by the railing and listen to fishermen singing across the shore. All day by the window my heart beats in silence. With nothing here to do, how will I survive spring? In ancient China, women were called Nairen, interior persons. They lived inside, behind the walls, where their lives were likewise interior. After visiting her hometown, I took a train to Hangzhou. Thirty minutes later, I got off in the town where Zhu Shu Jun spent the second half of her life, the married part. Before I knew it, it was my turn in the taxi queue. I told the driver the name of my hotel, but added, I wanted to stop on the way in the old part of town. I wanted to walk down Zhongshan Middle Road. The street dated back to the Song Dynasty, and its southern section had been fixed up to look as it might have 900 years ago during Zhu Shu Jun's time. According to an account 
I read online her house was just off the pedestrian-only part of the street in Baokang or Protecting Health Lane. I asked shopkeepers but walked past it half a dozen times before I finally found it. It's that little lane, that little hole in the wall there. I could see why I passed it by. It was barely wide enough to walk down. But just before the end of the lane at number 14 was Juju Jun's old house. The residents were distinctly proud of living in or next to or across from it. Apparently the knowledge of its existence never made it to the street. Given the isolation that a failed marriage bestowed upon her, I imagine she was grateful for such a place and for the friendships that a city like Hangzhou made possible. I could imagine her writing the poem she titled Around the Stove. Huan Zuo, Hong Lu, Chang Xiao Zi, Xuan Zhou, Xin Zhou, Shang Xian Shi, Da Jia Mo Xi, Jin Xiao Cui, Yi Bie Zhen Si, You Ji Shi. Sitting around a glowing stove, singing silly songs, straining more new wine, reciting more new poems, none of us regretting getting drunk tonight. This time won't come again once we say goodbye. The day was getting on and I still had one more stop. I asked the driver to take me to my hotel and to wait while I divested myself of my bag. My Chinese friend, Si Meng, was waiting in the lobby. She'd offered to guide me to my final destination of the day, the Huangzhou Botanical Gardens. It was only 10 minutes from the hotel, but it was already after 4 when we walked through the main gate. The place closed at 5.30, so I walked faster than usual. I was trying to squeeze this last destination into the day because this was where Zhu Xu Jun was buried. People had written about visiting her grave, but the grave seems to have disappeared during the last century, at least until recently. Before beginning my trip, I read an online account by someone who claimed to have found her grave in the Linfeng Tanmei section of the park. That part of the park was also one of Simong's favorite places, which is why I asked her to be my guide. When I made up my itinerary, I knew I would be looking for Ju Xu Zhen's grave at the end of the day in fading light and couldn't afford a wrong turn. In English, Linfeng means Spirit Peak. The ridge that formed the western part of the park is that her house? That's her house. Looking down at the top of it. Now we're at the park. The ridge that formed the western border of the park was known for its graves, and Tanmei means looking for plum blossoms. During the Song Dynasty, when North China was lost to the nomadic Jurchens, the plum blossom came to represent the Chinese spirit of resilience. It bloomed when the weather was at its coldest. Of the many poems Zhu wrote on the subject was this one. This is the title. I send this quatrain to the poorly located plum tree at the foot of the mountain facing away from the sun and finally budding in late winter. Si chao ye dian mei do jan zi dong shen shang wei han ji mei hua che ning nai Near the store by the bridge, plum buds are bursting. It's late winter in Hangzhou, but still isn't cold. I'm sending this to the plum flowers, asking them to wait. Without snow on the branches, who's going to look? For Jushu Jun, the plum flower not only represented the dynasty's resilience, it represented her resilience. She was a plum flower. That's why she asked to be buried here, where the people of Hangzhou came every year, especially after a snowfall, in search of plum blossoms. After passing under the, under the stone arch, we entered looking for plum blossoms garden, then continued across a huge grassy bowl to the foot of Spirit Peak. It was November. The Lunar New Year was two months away, and the mountain's, mountain's plum blossoms were still dreaming. As we walked along the foot of the mountain, we paused to read any and all inscriptions, but we saw nothing with Jew's name on it. We kept walking and eventually followed a trail that led past dozens of thousand-year-old camphor trees. The trees were as old as Jushu Jun's grave, if not older. Suddenly, I noticed that some of the paving stones we'd been walking on were tombstones. I slowed down and looked more carefully. 
I also kept looking at my watch. The park was about to close, and the light was disappearing from the sky. Finally, I called it quits. If I had stepped on her tombstone, I wouldn't have known. There wasn't enough light. As we headed back down the slope, I noticed several hundred narrow stone steps leading to the north side of the ridge. Even though we were out of time, I thought, what the hell, and started up. But halfway to the top, I stopped again. I was out of breath and told Simon I was turning back. I was exhausted. But Simon urged me on, and I kept going, feeling embarrassed that she was more determined than me. A minute later, as we finally reached the top of the steps, there was the tombstone whose photo I had seen online. Whatever had been carved on its surface had been worn away by centuries of rain. Someone had scrawled some words on it with red paint, but they too had mostly been worn away. That someone had dared to write on a tombstone. There wasn't graffiti on any of the others. I took as confirmation that there was something special about this one. No doubt the person who posted the photo felt the same. Whether it really was Jushu Jun's grave didn't matter. This was her favorite place, and that was good enough for me. Once I caught my breath, I took out the whiskey and thanked Ju for her poems. They were hard won, and we were fortunate to have them. Her parents were so embarrassed by her talent, they burned all her poems, all the poems they could find after she died. Lucky for us, someone gathered copies she had shared with friends, over 300 of them, and titled the resulting collection Poems of a Broken Heart. It was an apt title. The only good thing about her marriage was that her husband left her alone. And the only good thing about her relationships with other men was that she survived them, except the last one. The most repeated story about her death was that she drowned herself in Hangzhou's West Lake after one heartbreak too many. But the truth is, all we really know is what we can find in her poems. And of course, different people find different things. By the time I was done thanking her with my little offering, the park gates had already closed. Fortunately, we were still on Simong's turf, and she led me on a series of paths through hillsides of bamboo that circumvented the neon and the traffic and brought me back to my hotel. It was such an exhausting, yet at the same time Ill -ex exhilarating day, I shared two bottles of wine with Simong over dinner. Later that night, just before letting the day go, I read one more poem of Jews, one she titled appropriately, Looking for Plum Blossoms. When when tian qi se chun he, shi tan han mei man bo, xiao zhe yi zhi cha yun bin. When when xiao se se shi ma. The weather was so warm, it could have been spring. Looking for plum blossoms, I found a whole slope. Breaking off a twig and sticking it in my hair, I laughed and asked, is anyone more shameless? No one, Ju Shu Jun, certainly not a plum blossom. Well, that was an excerpt from the, this Finding Them Gone book. I thought it might be fun to do that. Um, do we have any more time? We do? Why, well, these are my encore poems. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, well, you never know. You know you, 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 all right. Straight. Um, these are by, uh, um, this one is by Li Qing Zhao, her contemporary. Maybe, uh, Li Qing Zhao lived maybe about 30 years earlier, also in that uh, 12th century. Chang ji si ting er mu, shan sui bu zhi wei lu, xing jin wan hui zhou, wu ru o hua shan chu. Zheng du, zheng du, zheng qi yi tan, o lu. I recall that sunset by the river pavilion, so drunk I forgot the way home, exhilaration fading, rowing back late, losing my way in a sea of lotus flowers, struggling through, struggling through, I startled a whole sandbar of egrets. And she was from the, the town of Jinan in Shandong province. Um, and uh, the, she is the most famous, Li Qingzhao is the most famous lyric poet ever uh, in China. Uh, that is, who sings, who writes her poems to a set tune. And uh, there was a man in the same town, born about 20 years later, who is the, her male contemporary, uh, Xin Shiji. 
This is one of the poems that he wrote uh, when he was there. I didn't know the taste of sadness in my youth. I loved to climb towers. I loved to climb towers and forced myself to speak of sadness in my poems. Knowing now the taste of sadness too well, I start to speak of it but stop. I start to speak of it but stop and say instead, what a chilly autumn day. Um, this poem is also by Sin Chi Ji, and um, it has a line in it. Uh, in the West, we have uh, our search engine is Google. In China, it's Baidu. Baidu means a hundred times, and it, it comes from this poem. The, whoever came up with that search engine uh, liked poetry, and so he quoted this this line from uh, from Sin Chi Ji again, twelfth twelfth century uh, poem. Uh, called New Year's Eve, and incidentally, in which you see fireworks. This is when they discovered fireworks. And so the, the, the poem opens with a description, a poet's description of fireworks. Yu a thousand trees exploded in the east. A thousand, a thousand trees exploded in the east wind last night. Showered down a rain of stars. Jeweled horses and carriages and incense filled the road. The tremulous sound of a phoenix flute. The transforming glow of a jade cup. All night, lanterns swayed, and she of the moth eyebrows and lotus-decked hair of laughter that beguiles and the subtlest of perfumes, whom I have searched for in crowds a hundred times. As I turned my head, she was there, where the lantern light was faint. That's all I got. <laughs> um, does anybody... Does, it, does anybody have any questions? Those are your translations? Yeah, they're all, all mine. Yeah. That's what I do. That's where I get my money from. Big money. Yes? <laughs> um, the poetry that's sung. Yes? Um, when it was first conceived by the poets, yeah? was it conceived in the form of song or in written? Until modern times, all Chinese poetry was sung. It was no, no exception. It's only nowadays people uh, read poetry, just like we read poetry. Um, I, I, I lived in Taiwan a while. I moved there in 72, lived there 20 years. And I you know, studied some stuff. And one of the things I'd studied was calligraphy. And my calligraphy teacher was the curator of the Palace Museum calligraphy painting collection. So he, every Saturday I'd go to his house, he'd bring out some stuff, and we'd look at him. And, and one Saturday, I asked him this question, the question sort of that you asked said, you know, people are telling me that, that you sing poetry, that you don't read it. Is that right? And he said, yeah, that's true. I said, well, here, wh where does it say to sing? And, and where does it say how to sing? Well, there's, there's no musical notes. There's none of, none of that stuff. You know, it's just, there's just the bare characters. And um, he went into the next room, came back a minute later, put down a bottle of whiskey on the table. <laughs> So in honor of my teacher, I am not, you know, failing his instruction, and I'm drinking. Um, in short, his point was, you, you, you sing them the way you feel them. 
Now there are certain poems to a set tune, but nine, that's, that's maybe 10% of all poem, poem, poems from the past. So you, you get wasted. I mean, you could do it without getting wasted. <laughs> but his, his point was, you know, it's better to sort of loosen up a little bit to, to, to <laughs> sort of discover, have fun with the poems in short. So, that, that, so the, the poet who writes it under, is writing for his contemporaries who do that to the poems. So he knows what's going to happen when he passes it out to his friends. You know, so they're going to do stuff with it. And it's not going to be the same. But it is all rhymed. And uh, uh, I'd say 90% of all poems are, all the, all the lines are the same number of syllables. And they're ry rhymed. And sort of like couplets. Usually four couplets, is, an eight line poem is standard. Or a four line poem is also very common. Um, I have trouble my own, with my breath. I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just sort of screwing around. If you ever want to hear somebody really do a good job, uh, Professor Wu, uh, Sue Jane, she can do it. And she's got a great voice and knows what to do. I, just, I don't have a voice and I don't know what to do, but I've got some whiskey tonight, so I'm, <laughs> I'm among friends. Um, so I just wanted to do that just to show you what, how they would have been, you know, how, the, the poems. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Do you do it the same way each time? What? Do you, do you sing it the same way every time? Oh, no. Oh, absolutely not. No, no. I have, just, I have no idea how to do it. And you, you just start and just do, do something. I mean, you have to know how to pronounce the, the characters, obviously. But you can do anything you want with them. They're just characters. They're just syllables. They have, they, have, they have their own tones, but you can do whatever you want. And I, you know, I'm a foreigner, so I can do whatever I want. <laughs> Nobody seems to care. Any other questions? Um, uh, yes? What is the status of poetry in Chinese culture now? I mean, did you meet people who have the same kind of affection that you do for these poets and their poems, or is it, is it in decline? I mean, what's the, what's the relationship now? They're much very... The, the, the Chinese, are, uh, you, the Chinese, I'd say, beginning, I'm, I'm not sure when it began, you know, maybe it's 10, 15 years ago, 15. The Chinese are discovering their own culture now. And, you know, they're finding something to be proud of, because they've always felt inferior compared to what else was going on in the world, I'd say, in the 70s and the 80s. Around the 90s, there's a transition that takes place. And now it's just the op now they're really into their own culture again. And uh, in fact, right now in, in, in June, they're going to they're, they're releasing a documentary film of, of my book. Uh, I mean, of my little thing. I mean, so they're really into it. In fact, a, and a TV station approached me about doing the same thing. So they're really into presenting their poetry to them. To their, even though I have to admit, the, the language is lo to some extent lost on them. Um, that is to say, this is classical Chinese. And they don't teach it that much in the schools anymore. They teach it a little bit, you know, but they usually, the, the, when they do teach it, it tends to be an elementary school where you're just teaching people to memorize something and, and then without teaching them meaning. But they're, they're experiencing a revival in their own cultural traditions now, and poetry is part of that. But of course, they're, they're, they're developing like, their own poetry voices, modern, modern voices, too. Um, uh, yes? I, I, wanted, I just wanted to say that even uh, in Korea, I think these classic po po poets are well known. I, I had your book at my house, and a Korean friend came, and he was really excited, you know, that these, I had these classic uh, Chinese poems, and he recited them. Yeah, of course, and especially that book you have, Poems of the Masters. That was put together in the 13th century, and and it, since the 13th, yes, yeah, since the 13th century, that has been the standard anthology used in schools, beginning in the third grade. There's about 230 poems, and they that's why he knew them. They used them in Japan, Korea, China, Taiwan. Uh, yes. 
you I bought this book, uh, The Zen Works of Stonehouse, and I just really appreciate the notes that you uh, have that accompanying almost every line. Um, it's so instructional, and uh, it's, it's been almost as interesting as the poetry itself, so I just want to say thank you uh, for taking that time, and I, I imagine that you take a lot of delight in putting oh, I do. Yeah, well, uh, my, my point in putting notes there is that I don't want to burden the poem with those notes. I mean, some translators want to put so much stuff into the, their translation because it's in the Chinese somehow. So, but I, I put, I put, uh, I just translate the words in the poems. And, and I want, to, I want the Western reader to know just as much about that poem as a Chinese reader. And so that's what I, I put in my notes, enough of that information. And I make sure that I don't put, leave, leave stuff in the poem that would, people would stumble over. So I don't leave stuff in a poem just because it happened to be in the Chinese. There, I know there's a, there are people who translate like that. For me, the, uh, the most important thing is to make a poem and to honor, honor the poet. And so I, I do my best to make a poem. I am not trained. I, I don't write poetry. I just love to translate poetry. I tell people it's like the difference between dancing on a dance floor alone or with somebody. I'd much rather dance with somebody. I could, I could, I'd never have the guts to do it by myself. But with a partner, then it's, it's a delight. And so I, I love to do that, and then I, yeah, so I, I do notes. I specialize in notes, because I, I really think it's important when we get these texts from other cultures that, that have traditions that they're aware of, that we Western readers should also be aware of these things, and that's a, what notes are good at. Good at. Um, any other questions? Yes? Ita oh, no. What? I, I have read four of your books in Chinese oh. version, and I really like your words. And I'm just wondering that uh, when you translate the classical Chinese poem, poem um, how do you preserve the essence of the classical words? Because they're very concise, and sometimes one character represents many meanings. And when you translate to English, it, it sounds very straightforward, and kind of, I feel like you lose the, the feeling. Well, then, if I lose the feeling, I've really done a bad job. I'm sorry if, if, I, if and when I have. Um, all I can do is, is the best I, I can. But I, I do have, you know, uh, I have an attitude that's developed over time. And I can honestly say that I don't believe the Chinese poem is the original poem. I think that's a secondary poem. I think the original poem was in the poet's heart. And that's the poem I want to get in touch with. Because I can't make my poem a, a Chinese poem. I can't, re, I can't recreate what's in Chinese. I have to make, a, make you know, uh, something that matches it, again, like a dance partner would. But, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to it's, like, it's like we're both dancing around the same circle. You know, there's a, a, a circle of energy and we're both dancing around it. And that, the, that, uh, that energy is the, is the original poem, the original inspiration for the poem. Um, but I just use that, too, as an excuse for my bad translations. <laughs> but but that's really, that's what I'm after. I'm, I'm after trying to recreate the spirit of the poems. But I obviously, you know, am lim have certain, I make mistakes. I, I, I have bad translations. Never. But they translate really good. Yeah, no, thank you, because I don't know. I've, there's nine of my books now in Chinese, but I would never look at them, because I would be afraid of finding something I didn't like. And then what am I going to do? It's like, it's like pulling a, a, a thread from your jacket, you know? And, and wh where do you stop? I, but I figure if my publisher found a translator and they went over it and it's good enough, well, that's good enough for me. Just uh, send me the royalties, please. <laughs> but I, actually, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't be a, I wouldn't be as happy as I am without the Chinese. You know, I, I, I was on food stamps until about five years ago, for 18 years, 
because I could never make enough money in America with my English books. It's only because the Chinese started buying my books that I'm drinking $15 wine. <laughs> Please join me not only in thanking Red Pine, but in congratulating him, because the American Academy of Arts and Letters has just awarded him the Thornton Wilder Prize for Translation. The highest award for translation. <laughs> Thank you. Cats out of the bag. Thank you. <laughs>